Our panel of break fix petrol heads are back for another rousing what should I buy debate. Using unique shopping criteria, they are challenged to find our first time collector the best vehicle that will make their friends go, where do you get that? Or what the hell is wrong with you? At the next Cars and Coffee. As we head into a new season of track day driving, we're faced with drastic changes in the sports car and passenger vehicle world. And so we decided to jump back to the what should I buy that started it all. We're going to talk about track cars. And we're here to answer that very question with our esteemed panel to settle another what should I buy debate. This time we reach back into our catalog of track day and HPD experts for their advice on what cars they should consider learning to drive at the limit. Joining us tonight are Mike Carrigo from Hooked on Driving, Nabil Abushar from Just Track It, Chris Cabeto from NASA and Hyperfest fame, and Jason Kennedy, joined by his chief instructor Rick Hobach from Auto Interests. And I'm your co-host, of course, I'm Andy Lee, and I'm currently driving for Flying Lizard in SRO and Lamborghini Super Trofeo, and I'm a longtime Bondurant instructor back in the day, which is currently called Radford Racing School. And like all What Should I Buy episodes, we have some shopping criteria. In this case, price performance and putting a smile on your face weekend after weekend are a priority. Our panel of extraordinary petrol head panelists are challenged to find the first time track day participant something that will make their friends go, you take that to the track? <laughs> <laughs> With that, welcome to the show, guys. A lot has changed since the first time we held this What Should I Buy debate between Brad and I. And it's been going on for years now, almost exactly four years. So we wanted to take the time to go back and revisit what's changed in the automotive world, what all of us have learned as coaches, as CIs, as HPD organizers, and say, these are the cars you should be considering going to the track with. In season one, we mentioned some really awesome cars. There are some honorable mentions out there that have stood the test of time. Things like the C5 Corvette, the E46 BMW, the Nissan 350Z. But if you think about it, a lot of these cars that I'm talking about are now celebrating their 20th anniversary, if not longer than that. We need to investigate, are some of these tried and true cars still worth going to the track with, or have they been superseded by something better? So I'm going to open the floor up because I know a lot of us are comfortable with BMWs, and I'm going to talk about the later 330s versus an E36, E46, like base model, talking spec cars. What are our thoughts when we talk about BMW first? To me, like the first thing that comes to mind is balance. Every BMW I've ever driven has just been easy to drive, forgiving to drive, just kind of a, a nice place to start. If you haven't done this before, you want to get into a car that's going to treat you nice until you get your footing. Both of my sons have E90s and they're six speed E90s and both of them are 325s. Oh, actually one's a 328, but you know, that car has a three liter engine, regardless of whether it's a 325 or a 330. You can do some really good things just by putting a three stage intake on that thing, a nice tune, you know, some decent exhaust stuff. Difficult finding limited slip differentials, but there is a company in Eastern Europe that do an LSD conversion that you can pick up for about 250 bucks. And if you're mechanically inclined, you know, you can put that thing in and and you've got a decent LSD. It's not perfect from what I understand, but it has lasted pretty long. So it depends upon your budget. You know, if you're looking for something that you potentially can go racing at some point, all of these cars, the E36s, the 46s, the E30s, they all hit that dip, you know, that valley. E90s are right there. It's a little harder to find a six-speed, but you can pick up an E90 for $3,000. That's going to be something that can go to the track. If you want a little bit nicer one, at $6,000. In today's prices, that's pretty cheap to just get started with a car. As far as the new one, it's still the three series. You know, it's just find the three series when they're down bottom of the valley before they everybody starts missing them. You know, I don't want to say it's a throwaway car, but if you really ball it up, you're not going to be as upset as you would with your GT4. Yeah, right. The amount of people that are out there at a track with them that are handy, that are helpful, that have a spare part, it makes it a really good, and there's a good community for it. So I think people really enjoy because it makes it easy you to become part of a group you don't want to be the guy sticking out that no one has anything and no one understands no matter what you think can happen to you it's already happened to someone else and they're probably at the track that weekend i always say like you never want to buy a car that you can't stand the idea of wrecking it or having some sort of damage to it i'm learning how to ride adventure motorcycles right now and part of riding adventure bikes is you fall over a lot so <laughs> you want to get a bike you can pick up and not cry in your helmet when you're picking it up and so i always have that same approach with track day cars too if i want to have something if i scratch the whole thing up bang it up eh, i'll still sleep that night. Got to be able to ball it up. 
with the BMWs, to your guy's point, it is a common denominator. When you look around the paddock, you still see high concentrations of three big brands, BMW, Corvette, and Porsche at any track day. So that's why I wanted to start with BMW because there's always this sort of every man to that car. People want to get into it. It's rear wheel drive, but it's not overwhelming like a Camaro or a Corvette or something else. I like how Chris went right to making mods to the car, right? Because those of us that are seasoned, we're like, man, we need to do this. We need to change that. We need to do these other things. But when you're coming in and you're talking apples to apples, let's say base model cars, we're going to pick up on a used car lot or cars.com. You know, these potential buyers haven't even thought of racing junk yet or some of the other websites where they could basically accelerate the process quite significantly. It's a pretty low barrier of entry. And I think the total cost of ownership, especially from a maintenance perspective, is also pretty low. It depends on how much money you have. It depends upon what you're going to start out. If you think you're going to go into something like saying the GTS class, ST2, ST3, if you think you're going to go there, then I think going straight into an E90 M3 or maybe an E46 M3 right out of the box is probably a smart move because you know you're not worried about power plant so much you just worry about suspension if you're going to try to start with an E90 325 and you eventually want to put a V8 in it or you want to put the power adders on it you're just going to run into a whole lot more cost so it kind of depends on where you want to go you know whenever I talk to people on they're just starting out I always ask them a question if they want to go racing or they just want to go have fun with a car on the track even if they want to go racing eventually do you want to go competitively or hey I just want to go out there and just want to sort of have fun racing on the track and so if you want to be competitive you're going to need to go into one of the classes that has a lot of people in it if you just want to go have fun and you love turbo yugos hey you know what build a turbo yugo and go have fun you know it's all about getting your jollies right and that's very true and one of the things i've always subscribed to especially as a coach and i think we can all agree to this is never modify the car past the driver's ability and so you want to grow with your car and that's why i think the bmws hold a special place that they can continue to be refined and evolved as you refine and evolve yourself as a driver so i want to turn to jason and rick to talk about that because i know you guys stress that a lot at auto interest we try to tell people not to mod their cars at all before their first track day. <laughs> we have mixed success in convincing them because people will contact us before an event and say, oh, well, my car won't be ready. I got to get it in the shop to get this supercharger and coilovers. And it's like, no, 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 you're first timer. Let's just get you on the track and get you started. And the best car to start with is the one you already own. I love that comment too, though. Like the best car to take to the track is the one you already own. Like they couldn't get any more simple than that. And I mean, the first time you go to the track, you're not going to go that fast anyways. No, no. you don't need anything. You're going to be so overwhelmed. We also believe there's a lot of value too in if your daily is decent enough car that it's in good running condition and fresh fluids, all that stuff, you already know that car very well. So you'll actually learn faster on the track that way using the car that you already know the driving dynamics of. So if you're just jumping into a different car that's unfamiliar to you for the track, you've got two learning curves to overcome all at once. So from just a pure learning standpoint, that's usually what we recommend. However, Rick and I started this race series a few years ago, and now we think that those cars that we run are the best cars ever, and that's in Spec Panther. The timing kind of worked that the coming out of service cop cars hit a very bottom in price. Turns out they're incredibly fun to drive. They'll oversteer, they'll understeer. You can make them do whatever you want, and sometimes not what you want. Those are, are a blast, and they're pretty cheap, and maintenance is low, and the parts are affordable. What what is Spec Panther? Yeah. Crown Victorias. <laughs> I just love the word Panther, number one, just saying. So Ford called that platform the Panther platform when they created ah. it. So that's where the name comes from. So it's the Crown Vic, the Town Car, the Grand Marquis. What you really want is the P71 package, which is the police duty Crown Vic. They really jump curbs real easy. They're super durable. I've owned one for five years now. And I simply put it in my trailer. I take it to the track. I unload it. I don't check pressures, oil. I don't check anything. <laughs> I get done. I beat it all day long. I put it back in the box. I come home for the week. And then the next weekend, I go back to the track. It never comes out. It never gets washed. I don't check anything on it. They just last. It gets an oil change every other year. Brake pads every year and uh, having huge brakes on these things. It's startling how big. I was going to swap some C5 calipers on it just to play around. And when I put them next to each other, I'm like, well, the Crown Vic is bigger. It was bigger than C5 Corvette. These things are just super durable. The hardest thing we had with them was keeping brake pads on them. And I reached out to Hawk and Hawk made a DTC 60 for us. So I run 60s all the way around. 
they'll just run forever. I mean, mine was 1800 bucks, had 130,000 miles on it. I think I've changed tie rod ends on it. Other super secret things that he won't say because he wins the championship. <laughs> Where are you guys racing those cars? We go Gingerman, Pitt, Mid-Ohio, Nelson. We've done NCM, Summit Point. That's most of them. How many cars? Well, how big's the field? They're not all usually at the track at once, which is something we got to work on. But I think we're up to about a dozen yeah. drivers with them. I think on average, it's like 8 to 12 normally show up. Do you run the automatic transmission or do you do a manual swap? No. No, no swap. The reason we call it spec is you got to leave it pretty stock. No shocks, no springs. You can't really do anything. We just put transmission coolers on them. It does benefit from that. If there was a weak point on these things, it would be the transmissions getting hot. Simple $100 Summit Racing transmission cooler works wonders. You know, they're durable. Do you race at night with sunglasses on? <laughs> <laughs> they still have the lights on them? Yeah. <laughs> Some do. Some do. Yeah, they run lights sirens got cop motor cop shocks you just found the next big spec series coming out in the future right yeah, yeah. it's going to be more popular in spec c5 big blues brothers it sounds like a police chase at some of the events <laughs> well before we go too far afield on spec panther because we we'll probably spend the whole night talking about that <laughs> i'm going to buy one right now he's on cars.com looking for one <laughs> i know <laughs> well eric when you talk about what should i buy like to every person that's going to be different you know there are people that are out there that their daily driver might be a Urus. So they're not looking for a $3,000 car. Their throwaway track car could be a GT2 RS. There's a wide variety of, in the spectrum of like, I don't think any of us that are in this group, I don't think any of us would take a GT2 RS and be like, that's my throwaway car. Except for you, Eric. Yeah, right. <laughs> in our normal shopping criteria, when we're talking about collector cars and things, we do try to put the budget of our buyer into a bucket to say mm -hmm. zero to 50,000, 50,000 to 100, and then a hundred to the stratosphere because you know yeah. it can just get crazy. But when you're talking about track cars, the numbers get significantly smaller. It's like zero to ten thousand, ten to mm -hmm. thirty, and then thirty and above, which is sort of on the same scale as when you're talking about collector cars. So I agree with you guys. I grew up under the auspices of a friend that used to always tell me, and Mike, you know this: if I can't put a boot in the side of your door, then this is the wrong car to bring to the track. Yeah. And that was coming from <laughs> a road racing background where you know SCCA and and other groups where it's like, you know, they still believe in rubbing is racing and things like that. Forward thinking, you do want a car more like an E30 or a CRX or maybe even a Miata. And I know Nabil has been patiently waiting to the side because I failed to mention the Mazda offering earlier on purpose, right? I said there were three brands when you look around the paddock, Porsche, Corvette, and BMW, but that's not necessarily 100% true. There's always this flock and gang of Miatas in the background. And I wanted to single them out and talk about them specifically because they've always been an excellent starter car. Because if you can drive a slow car fast, you can drive anything. I don't think it's good to talk about them. They've been talked about enough, really. They have, but I want to address them because everybody always says, Miata is the answer. And I don't know that that's necessarily true. And here's why. Just kind of want to throw some stats out there for people who are thinking about an NA or NB Miata. They are now being accepted into the vintage racing group. Like yeah. that has been their whole campaign this year because <laughs> that Miata is over 30 years old at this point point, especially the NAs, yeah. they're really long in the tooth. And if you get excited about a car that makes 102 wheel horsepower, I mean, yeah, you know, by today's standards, that's going to be tough, even at an HBDE versus going into racing. So I wanted to throw out there that even more importantly, the ND Miata, the newest Miata came out in 2015. So it's closing in on nine years old. So when is the fifth generation Miata going to come out? I don't know, but they're all getting old. So I wanted to turn to Nabil, who still runs an NC Miata, and let you talk about the Miata experience and say, is it still worth it? Is it still something to consider? Without a doubt. And I think the NA and the NBs, is, uh, they've been debated to death already. Also, they're getting harder to find, and their price is holding pretty steady. The NC, on the other hand, while a heavier car than the NA or the NB is quite a bit faster with the more sophisticated suspension, really easy to find, quite capable. And then, of course, now the NDs, as you mentioned, Eric. One of the things that I usually advise people when they ask me that they're looking for a new track car, I usually say, well, first of all, if you can, try to find one that somebody else has done the things that you would need to do to get it ready for the track. In the case of a Miata, get one that already has a role 
pole bar installed or a cage installed. All those things are mods that, you know, if you're buying them and having them installed, they're expensive and you never make your money back on them when you sell the vehicle. So when you're buying one that has all those things already done to it, you're coming out miles ahead. The only caveat there is you got to buy something that's built by somebody that knows what they're doing. I see so many cars come through, loose seats, seat belts on upside down, like their harness, the release is on upside down, or the bolts aren't in correctly for their race harness or this race seat that somebody installed for them or they installed themselves. So we see a lot of that. If I'm going to buy something or suggest to buy something that's already built, you really need to take it to somebody that knows what they're doing and let them look it over. Let them see it. Or if you see it on the track, you already know it's been through tech. You've seen it show up a few times. You know, it's not smoking out the rear. You could buy something you saw on track at a track day versus something in somebody's garage that, you know, you drive around the block a few times. You're like, oh, I love this car. I want to buy it. That would be my only caveat is make sure the stuff that's on the car is quality stuff that's installed properly. If you go down a different route where somebody just throws a bunch of parts at something, you're going to waste so much time and money and energy trying to get that thing sorted out. Yes. Miata, I think it's still the answer. An NC or an ND. And if you're looking for one, try to find one that at least had a roll bar added to it. I'm also going to agree with some of the other comments. Try it out as it is before spending money on coilovers and sway bars and exhaust to just make it louder. Don't really make it go any faster. Your investment in seat time will far outweigh your investment in mods in terms of lap times. The Miata is like the first inductee in the track day hall of fame. I mean, the car is, <laughs> it's been around since I started. It'll be around long past all of us. Followed by the E36 and the 944 <laughs> yeah. and like a bunch of other cars. <laughs> it's always going to be there. I just recommended it to a customer of mine that I coach and I recommended it to him for a couple different reasons. The car he had before, which was his first track day car, was like a 700 horsepower Porsche. And I was like, man, you don't have any time to think. You're in one corner before you know it, you're in the next corner. And the thing I love about the Miata, not necessarily the Miata solely, because there's a lot of lower horsepower cars that are great. It just gives you time to process and think about what you're going to do in the next corner. And as a coach, it's definitely one of those cars I don't mind sitting in the passenger seat. I'm not terrified, like beyond <laughs> belief. And usually if they don't have an exhaust or something loud on it, it's quiet. They can hear me talking. Just the benefits go on and on and on. As a car that's effortless to take from track day to racing, it's just a seamless transition. You work your way through the HPDE groups and you go right into club racing. And no matter what state you go race in, there's going to be at least a dozen Miatas. You're always going to have competition. I know it's not the most fun car to talk about, but I think it's always going to be there, Eric. A lot of these cars, even going from the E36 and on, they're not like MGBs. These are modern suspensions for the most part, and they are just good right out of the box. If you just spent the money on getting them reliable and putting in new parts, new bushings, and that sort of thing, you're going to have a very sweet handling car and probably go through HPD1 into HPD2 before you really have to do anything. When's the last time you saw somebody with a Miata in the paddock working on it unless it had a turbo on it or a supercharger? Doesn't happen. They are dead nuts reliable and that's just another reason that they're sweet platform. Nabil, I think you're right, man. That's huge because if you get out there and the car is breaking, you're not getting the track time. You're not able to develop yourself as a driver. So having the reliability is good. I think also having consistency is good. I do believe that you can come and do your first track day with your car as it is. Put the good brake fluid in it. And I always suggest, say, hey, look, brake pads are easy to change. Even if you're going and you're doing a weekend, you're going to be picking up speed even by the end of the second day. To me, having tires, even if they're, say, takeoff Toyo RRs or the Maxxis, they drop off competitively, but they don't necessarily drop off once they're no longer competitive. They're pretty flat line after that. So I try to suggest, depending upon who it is, to put a good fluid, pick up some used race tires, even from the used race tire guy, or if you've got the budget, buy some new ones if you think you're going to be doing it for a while. Because as a student, you are variable enough. If you're in a car that's variable throughout the session and also then throughout the weekend, you don't know when you're doing it right when you're not necessarily doing it right. If you can eliminate at least the brake side of things, that eliminates one of the variables. And if you can get good track tires on the car right out of the box, I think that helps out a ton. We really promote to bring all season 500 treadwear tire because we want you to get a little bit loose, a little bit of slip. We're going to keep you safe in that environment, but we want a little bit of learning to 
catch the car and learning to slide around a little bit, not forcibly, but just if it flips a little bit, we're going to correct it. We're going to help you fix it. And then once you wear those things out, put a 340 treadwear and then start coming back maybe the next year. And then eventually the 200 treadwear. We almost never, actually, I don't know if I've ever told anybody to get slicks or something that's an R compound to come to the track, even in an intermediate group. We won't do that. I've had a lot of guys ask me, how do I get better? And I tell them to go buy some junk tires and bring them and I'll work with them at the track with junk tires in an intermediate or even an advanced group setting because I think it just resets them as far as like when you have a Hoosier or something sticky, you're just driving around the track. It's just sticking and you're driving the car extremely fast. That's great. But if you want to reset your mind, drive something that's, you know, less grippy, less sticky, it's going to let loose a little bit and it's going to teach you to drive more at that limit. Having said that, some of the modern tires are just stupidly good. You know, the real high performance stuff, quote unquote, 200 treadwear stuff is still pretty good. Depending upon what they have, sometimes just going with brakes and fluid is enough to maintain that consistency, at least as they're getting started. But what about when we spend somebody else's money? <laughs> <laughs> That's always a good one. Yeah, I have a different thought because if you look at our novice group, most of them are not buying a dedicated track car. They want to get into it. They already have something they can use. And if someone likes it, it's usually going to be a dual purpose car. Nowadays, do I want an E36 or Miata to be my everyday dual purpose drive to the track and then get back? Probably not. That puts you in a different realm of cars. And you know what do we see most of the time? What is a great dual purpose? purpose car where I'm going to drive it to the track. I can drive it on weekends or even every day if I want to have a good time at the track, not have a problem, be reliable, not have to change tires, not have to change brakes and just drive home. I mean, that I think that's most of your novices. They already have enough going on in their head doing this. Oh my God, wait, I got to go change brakes. I got to get tires. I got to get this and that. And I think that's where today's performance cars, I mean, look at it. A minivan nowadays has more than 300 horsepower, right? And you know, I'm personal to the car in the, my background there. I think that's got to be one of the best every day, drive it to the track and then have a great time with just the tires and brakes that come on it and then go home. See a lot more now of the Mustang EcoBoost cars. They're just coming, they drive and they have a good time, they go home. It takes like a, a season or so before they say, you know what, I might want to do this a little more hardcore. And that's when the truck comes and the trailer comes because that's a huge expense. And if we really think about it in the long run, the cheapest part of your track weekend is probably the price you paid to register for the track all in all <laughs> for most of us that do this a little bit more than the novice you, know, you think about your hotel your fuel your trailering the tires the brakes that 400 bucks you're spending to register is like the bottom of the list on your cost scale pretty much keep the budget down keep everything cheap and then maximize your learning so someday when you do have the greatest parts in the world you can actually handle it 100 percent agree well let's not scare them all off now mike okay but <laughs> i like how mike kind of brought us forward about 10 minutes right in the conversation <laughs> i'm clear for <laughs> <laughs> but you know what is going to be fun to talk about? And we've batted this back and forth before, Andy. And this is the age old debate about rear wheel drive versus front wheel drive. And I'm going to leave the all wheel drive folks out of this conversation because that's a whole nother ball of wax. But we do need to talk about this a little bit because our audience isn't just stateside. It's around the world. And when you look across the pond, the ratio of track day front wheel drives, it's a complete inverse of the United States. Here, we love our Mustangs. We love our Camaros or Porsches or BMWs, front engine, rear drive layouts. But overseas, you got Citroëns, Peugeots, Seats, Volkswagens, Hondas. I mean, the list goes on and on and on of these very well-tuned, high-performance front-wheel drive cars, which will put a lot of rear-wheel drive cars to shame. So the question becomes, when you're going to the track, and both you and Jason mentioned it, Andy, run what you brung was basically the sentiment there. A lot of people buy front-wheel drive cars and nowadays all-wheel drive cars as their daily drivers. So where are we in the front wheel drive versus rear wheel drive debate, especially thinking longer term track day, maybe going into trials or club racing, something like that? Talking about the HPD world, which paramount is safety. The goal after that is really just to have a good time. If that's what you enjoy, do it. You look at the, um, the Civic R's, people are having a blast in them and some of the Hyundais, they're just having a good time. To me, that's what it's mostly about. You know, we're trying to bring people together. We're trying to keep them safe, but we want to really put smiles on everyone's faces. And if you can do that easily, easily by just having that front wheel drive car. As you know, when something clicks, it's just a light bulb and it's just so enjoyable.
enjoyable. You know, you kind of move to the next thing. And I like it a lot as opposed to the rear wheel drive car, which is like kind of your meat and potatoes of the track world in the States. Like you said, it's really coming higher and higher and higher where 10 years ago there was two of them. And now it's like a third of the field might be a front wheel drive or a wheel drive car now. So it is moving along that way because it's easy. I can drive it to the track. I can fit four tires in it usually if I want to swap at the track. And then I can drive it in the rain without a problem while all the guys in the rear wheel car are suddenly scared. I welcome it. I like it. There's lots of front wheel drive cars, but the hot hatches that you mentioned in Europe, they don't make it here because people aren't buying them. So it just doesn't make good business sense for the car manufacturers to invest heavily in hot versions of their mainstream cars that people buy to commute to work. There's not as many to choose from compared to Europe. And there's a mindset in Europe that those are acceptable cars. Enthusiasts here have been buying Golf GTIs since they first came in, right? But there's just not that much to choose from. Hyundai, Civic Type R, there are a few. I race a front-wheel drive car in Jam Car, and it's a lot of fun. We continue to see a lot of focus in Fiesta STs. It's a shame that Ford discontinued all of their cars altogether, but a lot of the big three are just really exiting cars altogether. But the Focus ST, the Fiesta ST, between my wife and I, we've owned both. We still have a Fiesta ST. They're a ton of fun. They drive really well. You don't really have to do anything to them for track duty. Get a decent set of tires and brakes on them and go. Yeah, we don't see very many at all. Oh, wow. We see a handful at every event. Small cohort of Focus and Fiesta ST. Where are you located? Middle America. That's why. We're in Ohio and the surrounding states. Everybody's daily driver in Ohio is not going to be rear-wheel drive. A lot of them are going to be front-wheel drive or even all-wheel drive. So I think we see a big influx of front-wheel drive stuff just because they bring their drivers out. It's weather dependent. Yep. We're going to talk about run what you brung or, you know, drive your daily there. Most people aren't driving a Mustang or Camaro in the wintertime. And I'm in Georgia and our track days are in the southeast and we do track days in December and January and February. Lucky you. Yeah, right? Yep. <laughs> hey, come on down. <laughs> I'm going to bring the Crown Vic. <laughs> bring the Crown Vic. I'd love to see it, man. <laughs> I think there's been a strong progression just in the front-wheel drive chassis. The chassis are so much better now. I mean, a new Civic Si, that's not your grandfather's front-wheel drive car that was a 1992 Civic. The torque steer isn't as bad. They've truly been tuned for sweet handling. They can hold up, but I'm, I don't care what flavor you dig, man. You know, you like chocolate, you like vanilla, who cares, man? Just pound the ice cream. Have some fun. I like that pound the ice cream. When I grew up watching racing, one of my favorite series to watch was the British Touring Car. Oh, yeah. Watching those guys beat the crap out of each other was awesome. And there's something really cool about watching a front-wheel drive car go into a corner, lifting that inside rear wheel off the ground. I just think it looks awesome. Or just have the front pull itself through, no matter what kind of mess they got into. All I got to say is Randy Pope's and Volvo. I mean, then we just leave it there, right? (laughs) (laughs) This argument actually comes from personal experience experience too. I've gone back and forth on different cars. I love mid-engine cars, even though I don't bring too many mid-engines to the track. I've run front-wheel drives for years. I've had rear-wheel drive cars. I was even told once, when are you going to get a real car? And I'm out there with a high horsepower front-wheel drive chasing down, you know, Corvettes and stuff. And I'm like, why? Why do I need to go spend $100,000 to do exactly what I'm doing right now? You know, granted, I've probably sunk that into my own car. Yeah. But the point being, I don't find fault with any of it. And even when I had my E36, people were like, oh, you're never going to be able able to drive that because your driving style and I'm like the line is the line is the line what we learned in HPD and track driving translates to the rest of our driving career so what I like to always tell people is mix it up come to the track with your Nissan Sentra or your Veloster or whatever you got and then if you want to ride in somebody's Mustang or if you got a buddy with a Miata take it for a lap or two you know you can do that in HPD event you can play around because it's a more controlled environment the speeds are slower find a car that you like that you resonate with and if it is a Honda Civic type type R, then so be it. To Chris's point, it doesn't matter the flavor of ice cream as long as we're all eating ice cream. So, <laughs> and we need to all be out there together, right? And having fun. And some of the best battles are in those mixed situations. It's not 9-11's run and nose to tail. That's the club race. That's a spec race, right? It's this mixing up of different cars going, wow, that was awesome. I can't believe I kept up with you, but you're faster than me in the straightaway a little bit, but I catch you in the turns. You know, we've all had those conversations. And so what I want is that the front wheel drive guys out there and even the all wheel drive, the Subaru, Mitsubishi crowd and the 
Audi folks go, I want to come and play too. So there's a home for all of y'all. If the all-wheel drive guys can keep their stuff running, then yes. Well, you know, I, I've been known to blow a wheel bearing or two, but I come with spares, so it's all good. But if you want the best of both worlds in front and rear wheel drive, get the Crown Vic. Drives like rear and pushes like front. <laughs> Panther. Now I want to turn the page and I want to talk about your guys' picks, you know, looking back again over the last four years of cars, you would suggest that people are at home right now. I got a minivan and I'm thinking about buying a sports car. It's time for my midlife crisis. What am I going to buy? What should I bring to the track? I want to go do what my buddies have been doing for years. Nabil, what's on your list? Something you would suggest to somebody that's really shopping for something right now. So this is somebody that's a beginner looking yeah. to get into it. It has the funds. Say we got 20 grand to spend. Oh, no. Give me more than that, man. No. You want to buy a brand new car? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's yeah. go new cars. Let's Why go not? new cars. Let's start there and go down. If you're going to buy a new car and you're going to take it to the track, I think it's important to get a car that the dealer is not going to try to cut you off and your warranty because you took it to the track. I like manufacturers that understand that their customers are going to the track and using their sports cars as a sports car. Porsche is one of them. You can do your pre-event inspection at your Porsche dealer. They know you're going to the track. They don't avoid your warranty should something happen. There are some GM dealers in the Atlanta area that are also super friendly to that. So people who take their Corvettes, brand new C8, have their Z06s on order or just got them, Camaros, etc. They get support from their dealer and they have a warranty. And that's like a dual purpose car, as Mike was talking about. Drive it to work, drive it to the grocery store, drive it to the track. And if you have an issue, you don't have to worry about, I've got to take all this track rubber off of the front because they're going to deny my claim. Which is a big issue because in the back of your mind, I've said, I'm going to spend thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 on a car. You know, I don't want my warranty voided the first time I go in there and a sensor went bad that has nothing to do with anything. The Camaro is nice. You know, you can do that. You can get a new Mustang, which are nicer. You know, something that's going to be stand behind it. So that's one place that I would steer somebody looking to get a car for doing track days. If that's in their budget, then definitely there are a lot of choices, especially from Porsche. If we're going to go the new route, which I would not recommend, by the way, I wouldn't go buy a brand new car just for track duty. If you can spend the 20 grand, like you said, I would go for a solid used Mustang. I've had a lot of Mustangs. I had zero trouble with any of them mechanically on the track. You get a GT or higher trim, they're going to be plenty of power, generally drive pretty well. If you can spring for some of the higher ones getting into to the mock cars or the Shelbys, it only gets better as you move up there. But a solid Mustang GT, you could do a lot with. There's incredible aftermarket of parts that are very affordable. So any mod that you want to do down the road, go to Summit Racing and they'll have it to you the next day and practically turn key. Would you start with the S197 chassis? Like you don't want to go back to Fox body or... No, no. S197 is going to be a good solid starter and be at that kind of price point sweet spot with still the solid parts availability and all that. Especially the Boss 302, which I think is like the best of the last before they went to the S550 chassis. Yeah, the Boss 302s are a good one. Don't buy the one on Craigslist that's been modded. (laughs) (laughs) I did that. (laughs) I actually did do that. Oh, man. There's a whole story there. That was a fiasco, but I still have that car, though. It's a 94 GT. It's all caged and everything else. Wasn't an ex-Bondron car, was it? (laughs) No, (laughs) definitely not. I want one of those old Lincolns that they modified way back when. Man, that just made me think about it. We used to have Roush prepared Crown Vicks were our instructor cars for a long time. They were manual transmission, caged. They were just, they were incredible. We're going to have to track those down. I think there was on Racing Junk the other day that popped up. They call them Cobra Vicks. They're like $30,000 now. I look every time they pop up. I've removed that link from my browser. I don't want to look on Racing Junk anymore. (laughs) It's like bringing an alcoholic (laughs) to the bar. Yeah, so he spends all his time on bring a trailer now it's the same difference right <laughs> yeah, yeah no i'm not allowed to do. i mean you know what my pick is going to be if it's new yeah c8 corvette all the way to the bank <laughs> it depends on what someone's looking for like do you want a two-seater car do you want a four-seater
seater car. I don't want to mod it at all. I want to drive it, have fun, and go home. And I want the dealer to take care of everything. You know, those are a lot of questions I would ask somebody. And so if someone's like, nah, I want a little something a little older, but I, you know, I wouldn't mind having a convertible because I'm not going to go to the track 22 weekends a year. I'm going to go three or four times. I might say, maybe look for a good Z4. There's a car you can take almost anyone and have fun with, have that power. You have that platform there mechanically, but you also have that nice top and you can enjoy it on the weekends for a nice drive somewhere and just put it away from the winter in the Northeast. If you want something new with that warranty and you want that two-seater car, I would definitely suggest the C8. I love them. Like I said, I have 15,000 miles on mine. We've done half of them are on track and it has been great. I, you know, we did 5,000 miles on one lap of America alone this year in it, me and Mark. And, you know, Mark is huge. I'm not the smallest guy in the world and we fit everything in there. Suits, helmets, chairs. Someone said, ah, I want a four-seater. And if you're into front-wheel drive cars, I would definitely suggest a Civic R or one of the nicer ones out there because you can have a good time with it. You have space in those cars, you know, with those back seats. You can throw four tires, a jack, change tires out and then not ruin your regular road tires you know there's a lot of options out there so it's really tailored to like what that person's budget and goal is i'm going to do three track days a year or i'm going to do 20 because i'm like us you know if they just want to go out there and they really have an affinity for a particular kind of car that's great if you really want to learn how to drive you do it in something low horsepower the v8 guys turbocharged 400 horsepower 500 horse even really three 350 when you're starting out it hides your mistakes you just don't get the opportunity to really learn how to drive. Number one, I ask that question all the time. I say, well, what is it that you want to do? And that helps me to guide you. You love Corvettes. And dude, that C8, what a freaking track weapon, man. I'm with you. Those things are great. But for a beginner to come out with something like that, you know, the nannies are out there, fine, but it's going to cover up the mistakes, the corner speeds that you're going to try to carry through there because the power is going to get you out of it. And you're not going to realize kind of like you do in a go-kart when you slide and you bog the motor. That's what a spec E30 will do. That's what a Miata is going to do. That's what a 330 E46 is going to do. They're going to let you know you screwed up. Good values. The Camaro, they're phenomenal. I see a bunch of those things coming out. They're stout. They're fast. They seem to be pretty reliable. And we're getting a lot more of those cars out. You know, C5, C6, C7 Corvette. If you still like the front engine rear wheel drive and you want a stick opposed to the flappy paddles, it's great. I've got a Jones for a C8. I wish they had six speeds in them. But I also try to tell people like, where are you going? How many of these are you going to do? I think it was Mike that said this earlier is that you have safety in numbers. So when you show up at the track and there are 15 other people with an E46 out there, if you break something, Thing, more than likely it's in the trailer and they've got the knowledge on how to fix it and be able to continue your weekend. The nice thing about the new stuff is it's new. It typically doesn't break and there's a benefit to that certainly. Specific cars, I think the BMWs are good. The Miatas, if, as long as you have a roll bar in there. But I tell you, the Mustangs and the Camaros, it's hard to beat, man. The 197s or either the 550s or the newer Camaros, they're good values and they're fast as all get out. The M3s, the newer ones, 2015 and up, they're fantastic and they're not at a budget for most people i have a couple do not buy first okay don't buy a cobra kit car yes <laughs> <That's terrible. laughs> i see so many emails come through people show up the track with these cobra kit cars they're just not safe they're twitchy short wheelbase they're terrifying for an instructor you're just not going to learn anything that's my number one do not buy another one be a one-seater car like somebody's race car that you can't put somebody in the right seat you're going to learn so slowly if you go out there by yourself and try and do lead follow and everything else you really need some way to help you out. And then the last one do not buy would be anything with aftermarket boost, turbo, supercharger, anything like that. It's going to fail. It's going to break. It's not worth it. Just stick with NA, stick with what it's got and go. So if you give me 20 grand, I'm buying 10 crown Vicks. That's my first one. <laughs> <laughs> He's buying a whole series. Truthfully, that's kind of how it started <laughs> like that. But anyway, if that's not an option, I'm a C5 Corvette guy. I think you could buy a C5 Corvette for 10 grand through time, throw another 10 grand at it. You don't have to do it all at once. So I think it's a great starter car. You can drive it to and from the track. You can upgrade it as you want. They take the parts pretty easily. They're not expensive to put parts on them. It seems like they're being harder and harder to find one that hasn't been like like just totally trashed, abused, or is a garage princess now. It's like trying to find an E36 M3 at a good price is almost impossible now. It's hard to find like a C5Z now that's not ridiculous and overly priced. And like ever since COVID, everything has just been crazy, at least in my neck of the woods. If they're not easy to find, 
for a good price where you know the history of it. Like I can trust this car. See them for like eight to 10 grand. And, and I don't honestly focus on the Z. I would almost tell somebody not to buy a C5 Z. I just base C5 because you're going to upgrade all that stuff anyway. You know, you're going to eventually change all the things yeah. that matter on a Z. Higher mileage, you can get one for a hundred, maybe 120,000 miles. It's not preferable, but they still last. As long as somebody took care of it, changed the oil, did their thing, they're going to last a long time. And we see a lot of them that, you know, guys will bring their kind of worn out, the seats are worn out, stuff like that. But again, you're going to put a three to $800 racing seat in it at some point to hold you in better. You're going to upgrade those things. It's perfectly fine for your first year of tracking, but eventually you're going to evolve it. Buy one for 10. Even if you needed a motor, let's just say the motor let go at some point, 3,500 bucks, buy a motor for it, put it in. There's a lot of room on those cars to modify as you want or slowly, and it may yeah. never break. Is it still an LS swap when you replace the LS? <laughs> <laughs> That was always one of my choices, along with the E46 and everything else like that. It just seems that it's harder to find someone that doesn't need like a complete set of bushings and everything to, along the line. And we all know that's a slippery slope. You change one thing. I'm like, while I'm doing this, I should probably do this and then do this. And then it became like a super project car where you're spending money fixing stuff rather than time behind the wheel. Mm -hmm. Eric, you know me as the Miata guy, but last month I picked up a C5 Z06. Congratulations. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, but I didn't pay 10 grand for it because this one was from one of my customers and it had some work done to it already. So Got that aftermarket turbo on there. Sledgehammer. <laughs> no, 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 no. Pure V8. Way back in the day, I had a goal and ended up in like Hot Rod Magazine. I built a 200 mile an hour standing mile car for 20 grand total, car included. That's kind of my specialty is making cars fast for cheap money. I don't do what everybody says you think you have to do. I just do what is necessary to go fast. You know, that was kind of like people say, buy the Miata, buy the E36, buy the C5. And I'm forget it's already 2024s are coming out already. And you're like, oh my God, look at the years. It ended in 2004. The newest one is going to be 20 years old. Exactly. Another thing, just don't skip around on cars. Don't buy a Honda Civic and then well, I like the Miata and then I want to get a BMW. Don't taste them all. If you want to keep it budget oriented and cheap, pick the car, even if it's a dream car, even if it's a JDM Integra Type R clone or something, buy the Integra base and slowly upgrade it as you can afford it through time. Because if that's your end goal and that's your dream car and that's what you really want to do, do that. Don't buy a Civic first, then buy another Civic and then jump in. You're going to be 40, 50 years old before you get your Honda Type R JDM spec finished. I think that's really what I would do to keep it on a budget. That or a third gen Camaro or whatever your dream car is, or even if it's a truck. We haven't talked about trucks. That's a whole different category. But if you wanted a square body truck, there's a lot of companies that make out great stuff. Like UMI makes fantastic parts for square body trucks that will be very capable on a track. I see guys race them. I race against them. There's some fast trucks out there. If that's your dream, do that. If you want to turn into a cruiser later and jump into a C8 Corvette later, okay, then you got a really cool street truck and then jump into your C8 down the road. I'm going to plug my daily, but it's the car I'd take to the track too. And it's my Mark 7 GTI. I knew I liked him. I'm just saying. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to go too old. I think the driver aids is a is a factor in all this too. Like as you're starting out, driver aids can be a nuisance if you go too old. If you go too old, they're obnoxious. They interfere too early. They're just brutal to use. Some of the cars you know, if you're looking five years back are not too bad, they can be used in the beginning when you're getting your footing out there, which I like. And so my GTI is a decent trash control system. I could just throw anybody in the driver's seat of it, throw them out on track, and I know they'll be okay. I haven't changed anything on it. Literally nothing. I put tires on it and brake pads. That's it. It's been the most reliable car and I've beat the crap out of that thing. So that's my front wheel drive pick. Maybe a higher end car. I'd say the other car I've had a lot of experience on track with in like OEM form is the Porsche Cayman GTS. You just can't go wrong with it. And you don't have to get the GT4 version. I worked at a private track and they had GTSs as like their instructor cars. We beat the crap out of this thing. It was completely stock, never changed anything but tires and brakes. The thing was phenomenal. And then I have my own pick, which is just the car I want to have for a track day car. I've always wanted it and I'm still looking for the right one, but the original generation Cadillac CTSV. Oh, uh, I love that car. I've had a chance to drive them a few times. That is probably the easiest car to go sideways 
I've ever driven. The easiest car to learn to drift, like bar none. Those are my picks. So what I like about this is you guys probably pick from each other's list without knowing. And there were a few in here that were definitely on my list. The S550, S650 Mustang was mentioned multiple times. And I like that for the warranty aspect and the problem solving aspect. I tell people this even when we talk about EVs. If you want to buy an EV right now, buy a Ford because there's a Ford dealer just about everywhere you can go. So parts are plentiful. They're easy to operate. They're actually really good on tires and brakes. They're in some ways like operating a Miata. They're actually quite cheap. The four-cylinder or the V8, they're well-balanced cars. That, and to Jason's point, you can really scale up a Mustang and make massive power really, really easily. Andy, you brought up the Cayman. That was on my list. Those cars are awesome. The more basic, the better. (laughs) Yeah. Because they're more fun, just like the Boxsters are, although I prefer a fixed roof over the convertible. But there were three other cars that I just want to mention. And I thought Arrigo was going to go here with this. The M2 is a fantastic track car. Better than the M3 and the M4 because it's really the size of the old 3 Series BMWs. As BMW has gotten older, they've kind of proliferated the scale of their vehicles. Remember the jokes about the M8 and IMSA, right? It's like a school bus compared to everything else. So the M2 is that right size. It's got that old school wheelbase. It feels like an E46 when you drive one, but they're hella fast. And they're still at a sweet price point where you can get one where it doesn't break the bank like some of the newer BMWs or even the brand new C8 and things like that. But there's two other cars that didn't get mentioned. The Supra, which Hmm. as we all know is a BMW, (laughs) but I've poached in them and they're fantastic. Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Ballistically quick. Well-balanced. The downside is they only come in an automatic unless you buy the smaller motored one. So now you have an opportunity to save some money, but still have that awesome chassis that BMW provided to Toyota in the super package. And then one other one that I think is constantly being overlooked, even though it borderlines being a GT car these days, I joke that it's the Japanese 928, and that's the new Nissan 400Z. If you want to buy a manual transmission, 350 50 plus horsepower sports car today for 50 grand or less. The Nissan is a really good buy. And despite the stupid drag races you see on YouTube and things like that, where it gets obliterated by other cars, that's not the point. How does it handle? How does it drive? We're talking about these Swiss army knives. I think the Nissan checks a lot of those boxes to say, I can drive it to cars and coffee. I can drive it to the office, to the grocery store and take it to the track. And that's a hard recipe to fulfill. And the cars that we've been talking about, the Mustang, the Cayman, Corvette in some ways, the Supra, the M2, those all check those boxes as well. So if you're thinking about a new car, especially that's important. Now, Andy, you hit on something really, really, really interesting, which is the nannies, as we like to more affectionately refer to them in the coaching world. From your guys' perspectives, because you have these driver meetings all the time, you're working with your coaches, you're out there working with students still. What are some cars where you're like, man, you better have the nannies on and others where it's like turn them off or a combination thereof or certain systems that you still don't really like or you really like, you think they're pretty awesome? I won't get into specific cars necessarily with this, but those have become challenging anywhere that a venue has somewhere to do it. We do car control at most of our events and we purposely in the car control like skid pad environment have people go through it with nannies on and go through it with nannies off and have them doing the same drill so they can feel what the car is doing and they know when it's correcting and exactly what it's doing. That's an important part of our curriculum in dealing with nannies. And then our general policy is that on the track, they do have to stay on in some capacity. If you have like a sport mode and it's still there, but it just lets a little more slip angle maybe or something like that, that's fine. But especially when there's an instructor in the car, they have to stay on. We don't necessarily have a hard and fast rule to say you have to have these on or you have to have these off. However, much is to do with the instructor and their evaluation of the student You know, when they're in the car with them. They are typically not going to turn the nannies off. I mean, we've had guys out there, they got these Hellcats. They're just silly. It's crazy that how much horsepower these things have and you really need the nannies initially because until you can develop some smoothness they, they really need to be there some of the systems are so good to chris's point from earlier you don't know that the car is saving your behind 2000 and earlier the nannies are pretty crappy 2000 2010 it's a mixed bag of just depends on the manufacturer you're right there was a period there where i wish the cars never came with them because they would have just driven better i don't know how many people i've told just turn that stuff off especially in a front wheel drive it makes it worse and 
anything after 2010 is a pretty good nanny in general terms. Sometimes we see a lot of issues like with older cars with nannies. Everything wants to overheat because it's trying to overcompensate, grab brakes, grab everything. It gets to be a problem because they're just not smart enough. The new stuff is very smart. You should always leave the new cars on 100% because it's so smart. You know, the point was made that some of the older systems aren't that great. And some of the newer ones can cover up so many mistakes that there becomes a learning problem. And then if you have an aggressive driver that's just driving into the nannies, it's saving him at every single turn. You just have to communicate and make him understand why. Take him to car control, back him down like 50% and go, look, you're driving at 50% and the car's all over the place. You can obviously feel that the car is safe. You. So you take, say, the traction control on your everyday driver. It's meant to save you in an emergency. And then we call them nannies. You know, stability control. And then there's your performance traction management type systems, your Corvettes, your Camaros, your Ferraris. And, you know, and you have different modes. The nannies on those were designed around being on a racetrack in addition to the weather mode and your regular mode and your touring modes and everything else. It's a big difference between the two where it can actually help you sometimes. And I'm going to use my car, for example. Example. There's a PDR on there. There's a track mode on there. I'm going to look at that. And of course, everyone wants a cool video of their car. So they're going to go back and look on it. But you're looking at that video, that traction control light. And every time it's doing something for you, it's going to start blinking right in the middle of the video. Even if you're oblivious, you don't realize the cars is helping you. When you go back to examine that video and you look at it, you can see, okay, yeah, something was going on here. It's doing things that you as physically can never do. You can't apply one brake pedal and and you can't stiffen one shock on one side to flatten you out. So let's not rely on that because when you get in a car without that, it's not going to work for you. There's a balance there between is it saving me? Is it making me faster? Or can I use that as a teaching tool? One of my goals usually is not just to teach someone how to drive, but to teach them how to self-learn also. If they can learn to pick out mistakes and feel them as they're happening, it helps them later on to identify. And if they don't know how to fix it, you ask questions and you get on with it. You hire a professional that's going to go over that data analysis and everything else with you. These cars, the newer ones, nannies are so good on them. Do you want to learn how to drive or do you want to have fun? So the thing is blinking. That's telling you that you need to learn something. But some people will be like, you know what? I just like going through here and I like hammering the throttle and, and I'm being ham fisted and I'm a squirrel. But hey, go out there and have fun. As long as you're safe and as long as everybody's bringing their stuff back home the way that they left the, you know, their garage in the first place, then I'm kind of like, you know what? Enjoy yourself. If you really want to learn how to drive, and understand throttle modulation, threshold braking, those sorts of things, then you need to gradually back off of those things. The cars are so incredibly capable. You know, when I started in the late 90s, hot car was an E36 M3 with 240 horsepower. I'm not sure what Mike's car is. What is that, about 650, 700 horsepower, Mike? No, I, I wish. I don't have a Z06 yet. It's 500 horsepower, which is a big difference from my first starter car, which was that M3 on track. And that was, wow, this car is fast now i'm like that car is fast with a fast driver a crappy driver in a newer car is just unbelievable because of what the cars can do and i think it started basically that nissan gtr when it came down with like you'd have to aim for a wall pretty much it's like the hand of god would come down grab you turn you nope go this way and then you'd be safe and that level of intervention i think hurts people learning it depends upon do you want to drive or you just want to go out there and have fun and that i think comes down to all of us that put these events on is really trying to determine what that is for that particular driver. But man, I'll tell you, it is a challenge, the speed of these cars. I was driving this one young woman who does HPDs with us. She has a twin turbo M5, 2016, I think, or 2015. And it's a stick. So it's very rare. And she wanted me to put some times down for her so she could have it on her data. I'm going to the braking zone at the back street of VIR at 157 miles an hour in a full four-door M5, basically stock except for brake pads and fluid. When I drove my American Iron Car, which was an S197 chassis car, now we're on 275 Toyos, but I think my top speed was 153 or 154 at the end of the back street of VIR. And I wasn't even pushing. I'm sure that I could have probably topped 160 on the back straight. The speed of this stuff is just bonkers. So that's where I tend to go eh, when you're starting. Starting out, let's have some nannies, but let's try to dial them back as you gain some experience or you're just not going to get anything out of it. You want to come out and you want to see the thing blinky blinky, but you're having fun? Go for it.
safety is paramount. We don't want anyone balling up their car. And if the nannies are going to stop them from doing that, then thank God that they have them. I would like to see people recognize when the nannies are kicking in and then learning how they can be just as fast, if not faster, without triggering those. And so when you're in the car instructing somebody, you can always feel it, trying to teach them to recognize the same things and then drive accordingly. But then again, you know, a lot of these modes, it's not just stability control, traction control. It's also the weight of the steering, the sharpness of the throttle, the linearity of the throttle application, things like that. And those make a big difference in how fast the car feels too. Never have a problem somebody putting it in Sport or Sport Plus, going all the way off. Not a novice, absolutely not. And I see people who have well out of novice that really lean on those nannies and when we can get in and coach them, we can definitely help them out a lot. If you do the track day insurance, they want to know that it's on. If you have an incident and they can figure out through the black box in the car that you turned it off, sometimes that'll avoid the insurance if you do that as well. Well, and you touched on something that I was thinking about too, and it goes back to what Rick said before. I actually like that weird, awkward middle ages period of nannies. You were kind of getting this mixed bag of berries and fruit. You weren't sure what was going on because every manufacturer was trying something different from 98 to like 2012. And the reason is it goes right along with what you were saying, Nabil. You get in the car and the car's telling you something. These new cars, to Mike and Chris's point, they're so stealth. You don't know that the nanny is interfering unless you go back and look at that data. You see that flashing light. You see it on the dash. As a coach, you don't have time to even look over sometimes to pay attention to what's going on. I like it when the car kind of does something and I tell the student, let's not make it do that again. Let's get to the point where you're <laughs> out driving these nannies and you're not feeling that, right? I mean, sometimes that requires you to slow down a little bit, whatever. I'm a glutton for punishment and I like intermediate students too because their skill level is all over the place. So the cars are all over the place. It's just complete chaos. But I think that's where we learn the most and that's where we have to hone in is as we transition a little bit more, we are starting to peel back the onion and turn off these nannies and really seeing the characteristics of these cars. And I think that's what's fun about taking some of these cars that we're talking about to the track because you read the magazines and the glossies and the rags and they're like, this car is amazing in a 50 foot slalom at 45 miles an hour. But on a racetrack pushed to its limits, you start to see the darker and uglier side of certain cars that aren't really as good as they're written on paper about. I think it's interesting. And there's certain tracks that are very telling of that too. And I won't name names, especially in terms of setup. Bad, name a name. <laughs> it's, it's the one with your favorite blend line, Mike. That's that one. I love my blend line. You guys sort of walked backwards into a conversation about track insurance, and which is super important nowadays, especially when you're talking about new vehicles and bringing new vehicles to the track. The price of even your base model hatchback these days is $30,000, dollars $40,000. You can imagine the scale of a, of a supercar over $100,000. In the old days, $9,000, $100,000, that was unimaginable. You, you, know, you were buying a Lamborghini at that point. Now, nowadays, this whole scale has increased. So when you buy a car like that, whether it's $50,000, $150,000, $250,000, you bring it to the track. Track insurance is key. A lot of people are still learning about track insurance. And so I want to hear from all of you all because you do push for those types of services and why it's so important and maybe the good, bad, and indifferent of that too. I worked for Open Track and I still promote those guys. I feel like they still have a, an excellent product and it's critical with some of these cars with the cost of them now. And if you have a bad day, trying to write a, another check for a car like a Cayman, for example, a sixty dollars to an $80,000 car, even the non GT4 version. It takes a lot of fun out of it. If you're going to take a car that's north of 30 grand, it's probably worth it just to have peace of mind. So you can be on track, you can push a little harder and not think about what may or may not happen, you know, if you have an incident. But I'm always a fan of it. I think it's a definite plus. I would add on that too. There's a lot of things people don't think about even beyond just the value of the car. Some of the newer policies, and you've got to really read them carefully because they're not all the same, but some of the newer policies also cover or track damage and things like that. Because if you want to pour salt in the wound of wadding up your car, get a three, four, five thousand dollar bill from the track for their guardrail on top of it. And the other thing to keep in mind too is there is benefit to instructors driving student cars, but we've had to tweak our policies on that over the years because. In our commercial insurance, as the event organizer, that used to cover, to some extent, when an instructor is driving a student car, that's
that's no longer the case. So a lot has changed in the motorsports insurance industry, especially 2023. There are numerous large players that exited the industry altogether. So you've got to really check up on the insurance requirements. If you're a student that thinks you may want an instructor to drive your car, which even if they're doing that, that's a whole nother discussion too, which is something we try to avoid. But certain carriers and certain providers do cover an instructor driving the car as well. So there's a lot to consider there. And we've had some drivers who unfortunately had some incidents over the years. And this isn't something overly common. I know we've talked about it a lot, but like, you know, I can count on one hand the number of cars that have gotten wadded up in the last two years at any event of ours. It's, it's actually pretty rare. So I don't want to spook people, but at the same time, you do want to be prepared for the worst case scenario. But I've had to argue with some insurance people who didn't want to cover people's cars on the track with their regular auto insurance. Thankfully, I've been able to win those arguments every single time they've happened. But what people usually find is that then there's exclusionary language added to their auto insurance if the carrier doesn't just drop them all together. So in general, I would say most of the large carriers have wised up to the fact that they're not going to cover anything that happens on a track at all. Some of them used to but most of them are writing exclusions for that. So the track day insurance is more important than ever if your track R costs enough that that would be a financial burden for you if something happened to it. I had a customer in the shop. He had a Corvette and he had track insurance and they were more than willing to cover it. I think he stated his value at like twenty five dollars or $30,000, C5 Corvette again. Well, they wanted to write the car off and eventually did. It had a bunch of body damage and stuff, but no structural damage. There was nothing really, but the paint job and all the things equal more than I think 50% of the value of the car that he had stated that he basically stated what he bought the car for had he stated what it really would have cost to replace like you know a normal track C5 Corvette let's say it's between 35 and 50 thousand dollars if you have all the things the brakes the wheels all the nice parts on it you won't get stuck in that where they're going to write their car off you can actually save your car if you stated your car at forty thousand dollars you know whatever car you had if you stated a little bit towards the high side not absurd but just a little towards the high side it'll give you that little bit of buffer that you might not lose your car and get it written off for something that's just to the insurance company. Well, it exceeds our algorithm, our formula. You know, you're over X amount of the value of the car to repair it and we're just going to write it off and cut you a check. I tell people, don't be penny wise and dollar foolish. If you're taking a car that's expensive enough out there, you want to get insurance. You want to get that insurance for that negotiated values. Like he said before, you're stating it. Said, well, I could probably buy this car for this or that. No. How much would it cost for you to go out right now and buy that car already made exactly the way it is. So if it's $100,000, put it down for $100,000. If it's $40,000, put it for $40,000. Don't try and save $400 a year on your yearly policy by dropping that price that much. I buy a yearly policy. You know, does it make sense? Sometimes maybe, you know, what I'm buying more of than the financial protection, I think more is peace of mind. Okay, I know that this is all good. I know that if something happens, I'm going to be covered, including up to this car being a total loss. And that's why I do it. And I just renewed my policy, not because I want insurance, but because I just want to see Andy's videos, honestly. <laughs> they also have a liability option too, which is just in case you accidentally, you know, you're new to this, you might hit somebody else. There's other things besides you just having an incident, but I just don't know why you wouldn't do it if you have a car that's very valuable, like the C8 that you're driving around. I mean, I absolutely have it. You know, under 30 grand, I don't know. Then it's like, you're getting into that space where it's like, ah, I might take the chances, but above of that i'd probably have and that's why the answer is miata because it could take a licking and keep on ticking right yeah i don't know if anyone else is doing it but open track is pretty much the only ones that are writing a yearly policy so you're doing x amount of days a year do the math it's like you can go to any track as many times you want and you're covered for that one price take a look at it. if you think you can do this x amount of times do the math then figure out if it's worth it because on top of that there are a lot of tracks nowadays that companies will not write a daily policy for anymore They'll write a policy at, at our on driving events. But I notice there's more and more places that they won't write a single day policy or a single event policy for anymore unless you have that yearly policy. It's one of those things where nobody wants to use insurance. You just want that peace of mind for it. Several people that I know that have the track day insurance, they've needed it. And boy, I'll tell you what, they're a lot less depressed than those individuals that I have run into that I've had to send a bill for guardrail at VIR to who just wadded up their $40,000 whatever. 
it's a peace of mind. And I think to a certain extent, it's almost the mental equivalent of a racing seat. You know, I remember when I first moved from a stock seat way back when, when I was doing HPDs to a racing seat, I was blown away with how much more connected to the car I was. There's a tension that goes away because it's just a variable that you don't have to worry about any longer. And I think that with the track day insurance, if you've got something that you can't ball up without you being mad at yourself or some significant other being mad at you as well, probably best to have the piece of mind because you're here to have fun. If you're worried about the car and you're not going to really learn what the car's limits are because you're concerned with balling it up, you need to get rid of that question mark in your head so that you can just relax and enjoy yourself. So at the top of the conversation, especially during the introduction, we talked about the changing landscape in the automotive market. As we all know, in the last couple of years, especially the increased market saturation of EVs is just astronomical compared to what we thought, you know, oh, they're a fad, they're a joke, they're never going to catch on. It's, you know, Johnny Cab, it's all these kinds of things. In the last four years, since the last What Should I Buy track cars, there are more Teslas showing up. There are more EVs showing up at track days. And even there, there's a mixed bag of reactions, not only from the drivers, but from the tracks and the facilitators themselves. Some tracks have outright banned EVs from participating, you know, if they're not just in the parking lot. And there's others like VIR that are completely embracing the EVs, putting in all sorts of new add-ons to the facilities and things like that. So as HPD organizers, I wanted to get your guys' thought on on the increase in EVs, what they're like on track, how you guys are handling them, special concerns with respect to EMS and EVOC and things like that. What's the story on EVs? There are different rules at different tracks. Thankfully, we don't go to any tracks that have outright banned them. We get asked for charging stations all the time, which is not always something that is easily accommodated. So the charging is an issue. Most tracks don't have any charging infrastructure. So the amount of time you could actually use it can be severe limited. But the main concern from the tracks, and I've talked to a lot of tracks, fire and safety crews about this, is their ability to put them out if there's a fire. With the large capacity batteries and all of that, they're very difficult to extinguish. And in the Tesla guidelines that are given to fire departments, it says it takes 8,000 gallons of water to put out a Tesla if it starts on fire. But there is some new technology in the fire safety market that I've learned about because there are one or two tracks that we actually run our own fire safety crew. There's this stuff called F500 that's a molecular level neutralizer of flammable substances, and it can reduce that 8,000 gallons down to like a few hundred. The track safety crews have to get the experience to learn the tools that are available to them to be able to accommodate those things. So I think that's an issue is the track safety crews, depending on how well they're equipped, probably directly determines their response. I mean, I had one track tell us like, hey, we have a pit full of water. And if an EV catches on fire, we're going to grab the front end loader and it's just going to get dumped. That's your way of handling it. Okay. You know, that's the main concern is is fire risk. And that's why they get banned at certain tracks because they either don't know what to do, don't want to deal with it, or some combination of those types of things. That's the perspective I have on it. From a driving perspective, I've not driven one on track, so I can't speak to that. But I know the people that do have a great time with them and there's nothing wrong with that standpoint. I've had a Tesla. We have two tracks now going on three possibly soon that will not allow EVs at all in any way, shape, or form. One of the things I'm looking at with the tracks, I'm like, you're not distinguishing between a battery like a Tesla that's, you know, a large car with 100 kilowatts of storage and a Ferrari SF90 or the new E-Ray that's coming out or the 918 in these cars that were specifically designed around a hybrid technology for the racetrack. I'll exclude the 918 because that's kind of special, but look at the Ferraris, look at the new E-Ray. They're not plugged in. They have nothing to do with any part of the car. Your average diesel truck with dual battery setups probably has more potential energy than that little tiny one and a half kilowatt battery that's just there for torque vectoring. And it seems that they're lumping them all in the same category because they're worried about how do you put this fire out? The problem with the EVs, and it's happened in some places, is that when that battery catches on fire, it will not go out until all the energy has been 
extinguished from that chemical reaction. All you can do is try to keep it cooler and cooler and cooler, which prolongs the process but protects the surfaces and other things. In Europe, when they race those type of cars, what they actually do is like what you had said before. They're basically taking a payloader and they have like a 40-yard container type of deal with water in it. It's getting picked up and it's getting dumped in there. And that's it because it just has to keep the battery cool enough while it's losing that energy. I'm not happy about it, but we have to work with these tracks and possibly say, hey, can we buy an insurance policy or something to cover some of these and start to get a list of vehicles where we can all be happy with? Okay, you don't want a Tesla that's got 100 kilowatts. You don't want these certain cars with these very large capacity batteries, but you're banning now performance-oriented, strictly track-focused type of scenarios that these were designed for. Electrification as a whole is just going to keep going in performance cars because we've maxed out what these natural aspirated cars can do pretty much. And we've added turbos to these things, only kind of forced induction. The natural progression is to add electric power. So I think more and more cars are going to be made in some sort of capacity, whether it's an extra set of motors to make it all-wheel drive, whether there's something built into future bell housings. It's going to be there. I don't like putting a Tesla on track anymore for a couple reasons. People don't seem to realize how heavy that car is and how taxing it is on the brake. And when you're drive by wire, it's a little bit harder to distinguish when something might be getting a little too hot. I think they're the future, but I am not a fan of having an all electric, very heavy car on track anymore. You're going to have a hard time with infrastructure. Even if we ended up with 25% of the cars out there that would need to have that kind of fast charging capability, I don't know where they're going to put it. I mean, some at points ban them just completely. Yeah. And they have chargers there for them. No one is going to have the infrastructure to have that many cars. Even when you have a place that's got 50, 50 amp plugs in there for the RVs, it's just not enough electricity to charge that car up. So I don't think the plug-in cars that rely solely on electric are a good alternative for a track car, maybe for a session or two but they need too much prep work to be safe on track as opposed to your normal everyday car, which you can go probably for that same price. One of our tracks that we go to is banned electric vehicles. Another one, which is actually, if you search for it and put in electric vehicles, they have most of the stuff that comes up is, oh, how they were one of the first to add fast chargers there. But now they have a addendum that if you bring in alternative fuel vehicles, vehicle that you hold them not responsible for them moving the car by any means necessary extinguishing it by any means necessary and the possibility that they wouldn't be able to do that and all the damage that it would create because what they're really worried about is that car goes on fire it damages the track surface we're closed down for a month fixing it as a event organizer and promoter i mean that's not something i want the last thing I want is to shut down an event because one reason or another, in an electric vehicle fire, that can just put a hole in the track. And then if I'm responsible, because absolutely, I'm the one who signs the contract, what if they can't hold an event there for another two or three weeks or a month to get that repaved? It's not a risk that I can take. When people ask me, can I bring my Tesla? I say it's not a good idea to, and a lot of the tracks don't allow them anymore. Do you have something else like a Mustang or a Spec Panther, right? Or a Spec, <laughs> spec Prius. Spec Prius. <laughs> I like it. I like I it. I so badly want to drop a Prius from a helicopter at Hyperfest. I can't tell you. <laughs> Top Gear got away with it. I don't know why you guys can't. <laughs> well, Toyota's a sponsor of. Oh NASA, yeah, so. they wouldn't be happy. <laughs> I don't know if they'd be happy with me making fun of the Spurious. Our last topic to cover here quickly. A lot of us have graduated away from. HPDE on a personal level, but we're still involved in the world as coaches, as organizers, as CIs, etc. But we made this transition in our driving careers. And so we touched on it a little bit earlier, but I wanted to just quickly talk to the people out there that are listening to this that are already going to the track and are thinking, I want to go to time trials. I want to go to club race. Is my HPDE car suitable for that? So I was sort of wondering if everybody put together a list of cars that have that natural progression. Some of them we talked about the E36, the E46 got an old 944. That's a good option, a Boxster. What else is on the list that could move out of HPDE into trials and into club racing? And I'm going to start with Chris. 
at the head of NASA to talk about that progression path? Well, it kind of depends on what you dig, you know, what flavor. If you like something that is Japanese, you know, the Miata is a tough one to, to get around, really. You know, I mean, there are a million of those race cars out there. Spec Miata, whether you're running NAs or NBs, you know, if you want to go into Cup, that's the ND. It's a tough one to not point toward. Now, our Honda Challenge Series, and I hate to make it specific about NASA, but there are only a couple of amateur racing organizations really out there that are non-denominational. The Honda Challenge actually is going through a transition right now from a lot of the old, you know, 92 Civics and Tegras and things like that. They're still fast. They're still competitive. We're seeing some of the newer cars coming out, you know, the 2000s model Civics and things. I think if you're V8 oriented, to look at an S197 chassis Mustang. I think one of those cars is great. The newer Camaros haven't really started to go racing yet. We have a lot of people time trialing them. There's a really good place in Super Touring 3 for those cars. So I would say that if you dig those Camaros, that kind of V8, the newer ones, that's a good place to go. We're starting to see a few more of the C5s come in if people can find them. There's people want the V8s and there's a sweet spot price-wise. So I think that's a good one that you can build into a race car. From the German side, it is difficult to get away from Spec E46. Spec E46 is a phenomenally prolific class that has done very well, and it's got a lot of support. You know, James Clay from Bimmer World pushes those things. They have great leadership within the series. It's a good formula. It's very close racing. They are reasonable. You can build one if you're working for 35. You can buy one for 35,000 right in there, give or take three or four thousand bucks, depending. And if you want to start with one, you go buy a 330 for 4,500 bucks or, you know, that's a kind of a beater. You can drive it around, build it as you want over time as you learn your skills and boom, you've got yourself a race car. If you want something a little less expensive, the Spec 3s, you know, the E36 chassis, the 325 and Spec E30, man, I know this is my class and I've done a ton with this and my son and everything, but man, we can't kill that class. I wrote the rules for Spec 3 along with Barry Battle when he was working at RRT, but the idea that the Spec E30 is going to go the natural progression that every class does and, and eventually die out, man, I'm telling you, Carter Hunt wrote a phenomenal set of rules Rules. Things been around since 2004. So that class itself is 20 years old almost. And still have 400 cars out there racing. And it's phenomenally good racing. You can still get parts for the most part. Some are a little challenging, but it's hard not to say start out with one of those cars. Again, I always suggest start with low horsepower stuff and move your way up. I've only ever raced E30. I've never raced any of that. So basically, you know, when I look at that, it's like, what kind of racing do you want to do? Are you a time trial or time attack? Do you want to do like sprint races or do you want to be in an endurance race and that kind of makes a difference you know for someone who's going to do normal like kind of sprint races i would suggest go through a series of some sort like chris had talked about or bmw club racing or the you know the spec e46 or you know your spec miata classes with nasa or scca because you have a really defined set of guidelines to get your feet wet and not stumble so much along the way you want to do like close endurance races i would tell people said number one go to a race school somewhere go to nasa go to bmw W, go to some really accredited real school, not a rubber stamp school. Don't go on Facebook and say, oh, look, someone's renting a seat and they will teach me how to race on Friday during practice. Don't do that. Choose wisely what you want to do. And I think a spec class is really one of the best ways to get started because they've already given you a roadmap. And then from there, grow. My organization is not a racing organization. I do participate in endurance racing, though, with, with friends. And these are are the low buck programs uh, like Champ Car and my friends are shake tree mechanics. They wrench, they can tear apart transmissions and rebuild them. So almost anything is fair game, but you got to read the rule book and figure out what makes sense and what can be competitive within the rules. And most of that is strategy around can you run two hours on a tank of gas and run a lap time similar to the other people in your class. There are endurance here right now, such as WRL, where you're seeing factory-built race cars, people buying TCR-class cars, GT4-class cars, $250,000, and they used to be a low-buck series. <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore. C5 Corvette for me would be the natural transition. Again, they're fairly low starting point. You can build them from $10,000 up to $100,000 plus, depending on what you want to do to it and how far you want to go. It's just an easy way to get 
in and continue going. A lot of people bring up the C6 Corvette. They're essentially the same underneath. The C6 starts with a little bigger, better motor, more horsepower, but really the geometry, some of the parts interchange, I mean, they're very similar. There probably is more support for body components for a C6 than a C5, but really you're going to put a wing and a splitter on and you're going to go. The easy decision for me would be C5 to really take with you to the next level from HPDE up into some sort of racing or time attack. I mean, I do a lot of time attack stuff too. So I didn't really talk about that, but you know, rather than go wheel to wheel racing, you can go time attack and get fairly radical with whatever you're building. A lot of groups, there's some rules to unlimited builds. You can build anything your imagination can dream up, which is fun. I mean, I, I like to play around in those arenas because I don't really like rules. I like to express myself and go nuts. Buy a go-kart. <laughs> That's what I would recommend. Every time I get this question, I don't think people understand the amount of time, effort it takes to go racing when you're doing it all yourself. The track time is great, but I mean, when I was maintaining and working on my own car and going to the track, man, the hours I would pour into prepping it, loading it, unloading it, getting all the supplies, making sure my entry fees are paid, all that stuff, it can take away from the fun. And luckily I was in my early twenties and I didn't have any responsibilities, but if you have kids and family and work commitments and stuff like that. It's a big, big commitment. And I can tell you that racing a 125 shifter cart would blow your mind. <laughs> and nothing could even come close to how incredible that feels to race. And, and it's something if you have kids, you can take them with you. And all you need is a pickup truck, a fuel jug, and a cart stand and a small little toolbox in your set. If you go the race car route, you got to get the trailer got to get all the stuff. It's just a, a lot more money. But if you're determined to go race full-size cars, though, and if the go-karts are not cool enough, if it's me, if I'm going into this world, I want to go see, because every region's got a different class structure, and some classes are popular on the East Coast, but not on the West Coast. I think you really have to go to the track and visit ahead of time and see which class is most competitive. Because if you want to race, you want to race. Like, you don't want to be one of three cars in a class. So you want to go out and see what is the most popular class. I think it was Rick mentioned, like, if you're going to go out and buy a race car to buy one that's already built, I look at the result sheets from the previous season and try to figure out which cars were winning, which cars were doing well, and see if I can offer one of those guys a little bit of money for that car. Something that's clearly performed and, and is put together well. But spec series are usually where it's at. I was just out in California coaching at a POC event, and they had a spec Boxster class, which was awesome. And they had like 25 cars. And so that was pretty entertaining to me. I thought that would be a fun class to go join. Obviously, in NASA, the BMW class is out west are really nice too and e30 e46 those are great spec is nice because although they say it's the driver yeah it's a lot of setup and little tricks and of the trade that go into getting a winning car but it's a little closer to at least showing where you stand in your ability level you're always gonna have somebody to race in a spec class whether you're at the back or the front so it'll be fun no matter what i think there's a financial component to this as well and one of the things that i try to tell people is especially if you're starting out find a class there are a lot of other people in because there's a market for that. You want to run a turbo, you go great. But if you go to resell the thing because you want to move to a spec Miata or whatever, you've pretty much got yourself a car that you're going to get maybe 25 cents on the dollar that you put into it. Whether it's one of these spec classes, E46, E30, Miatas, there are enough of them out there that a specific market prices get established. And if you need to get out of it for whatever reason, whether you want to try to move on or you just, hey, lost my job, having one of those spec type of classes or, or anything that's got a, a large following, I think is really important. I will say one thing too, is that it's not just about buying the car. It's about having the funds and understanding the maintenance of the car. It's about understanding the, the consumables, all those pieces that go into it. You know, you need to have a reserve of probably a good 25%. And I would say that's maybe a minimum over what you're going to put into the car itself. Maybe have a goal to or a dream that you're heading towards. And that'll kind of put you on a track also of what kind of cars to consider. And another little thing that I, I usually ask people, like, do you want to stay in GT cars? You know, like in NASA, if you want to do like a prototype sort of thing, you have like the little MP01, if you want to get a chance to feel that, or do you want to do eventually trajectory wise, go vintage or something like open wheel stuff? Like you may want to consider buying something that puts you on that path so that you're not jumping all over the place. SCCA has the Formula Enterprise series. If you want to live your dreams of being a Formula One driver, you know, you could do all that, but also a nod to the vintage racing places like BRG and SVRA, et cetera. There's a lot of turnover right now in classic cars and if you want to relive those glory days,
days of running MGBs and Triumphs and all those e-prepared British roadsters and things like that. Now's the time to get into them. So they are good value for money. And those cars are dirt simple to work on. <laughs> Four bolts, the motor's out and it's got two wires attached to it, right? <laughs> One of which works because they're British, you know how it is. But the, the point is there's a lot of open market right now. So we've really swung the pendulum one way to the other. And there's a lot of things for people to consider and to chew on. So as we wrap up this episode, I have the honor of asking all of you, any shout outs, promotions, or anything else you'd like to share that we haven't covered thus far? We started the Hell Hyperfest to help to grow the sport. Y'all are my brothers in speed, and we are all helping to grow this thing that we love. I have a hard time shutting up about something when I find something that I love, and I just want to tell everybody about it, and I drive everybody crazy. The Hyperfest was sort of an extension of that. We have some fun stuff. Hyperfest GT is a new series based on the ST4 rules within NASA. Our inaugural race was this past year. We had 54 cars. We started 50. We had a guy you may know, Tommy Milner was driving one of the cars and we had uh, Chelsea Denofo just won the Formula D championship this year. He was also in the field. That'll be coming around May 17th to the 19th. This will be the uh, 24th year that we will have put the event on. Of course, NASA Mid Atlantic is the underpinnings of all of that, but Hyperfest is a mecca. You know, if people don't know what it is, it's not just road racing, it's, it's drifting, it's ride-alongs, it's rally, it's off-road, power wheels, downhill, racing. So if you don't have anything and you can't afford a Miata, you can always get a Barbie Jeep and pull the motor and the <laughs> and the battery out and, and go down the roller coaster at VAR. So anyway, that's my push for Hyperfest. I own auto interest, so we really specialize in getting beginners on track. We really focus on the educational elements as well in all groups. So I like to think we're a little more education focused than your average HPDE. I have a separate company called Trackside Systems. It does event registration ticketing, but also all of the tech for the learning in our HPDE program. So we sell that software to quite a few racetracks around the country and some other more traveling customers. We originally built that just for auto interest. And one of the key features of that is we have an 88 point curriculum in there. The instructors go in and evaluate against each and every one of those points. We keep all those records in a history. And then there's a very clear path to advancement. So a lot of HPDE is very subjective as to what novice and intermediate and advanced might be. Some might use arbitrary numbers of track days, things like that. We use actual signed off competencies to get to the intermediate level. There's a certain set of skills that an instructor has to sign off in the system. And that's how we manage that. My plug is obviously for what we do on track, but then also the technology behind that. Besides seeing me at auto interest events, doing my thing there, and then behind the wheel of a Spec Panther, you'll probably see me behind the wheel of a race pickup truck sometime this year. There's a company uh, called LOJ that they make conversion. They make LS swap kits for a bunch of different vehicles, including a Nissan Frontier. I've been coaching a guy for the last two years. He's won the Optima Ultimate Streetcar Challenge two years in a row in the truck class with his thousand horsepower all-wheel drive sequentially shifted, super wide-bodied, 345 squared setup for his Nissan Frontier. There's going to be a, another version of that truck built, and I'll probably run that truck plus another version of that truck this year a little bit. Look for me on some TV shows. Was it SEMA? And a couple of people are reaching out to do some driving for some TV shows and stuff. You'll see me floating around. So you can find me at Rick Hoback anywhere on the social medias and follow up and see what I'm doing. And a spoiler alert, maybe we'll have you back on Break Fix for your very own episode. Maybe. I've done a lot of different things. I run a group called Just Track It out of the Southeast. We run basically January through December, 15 events on the calendar and probably at adding one or two more. We are proud of our instructor training program. We have probably the toughest and most comprehensive instructor training program. We're definitely committed to the education part of high-performance driver education, particularly with novices. We also do offer advanced coaching services to drivers that have moved on out of the clutches of an instructor and are plateauing and not able to progress further or not progress as fast as they'd like. We've got a brand new program for referrals. So if you are referring somebody that's never driven with us before, you get 10% off your registration and they get 10% off of their registration as well as we try to get more people to bring their friends to the track. It's most fun when you're at the track with your best buddies. Figured that may be a way to encourage that. We also have a membership program 
program that's optional where you can pay an annual membership fee and save 10% off your registrations. Makes sense if you do four or more events a year with us. We love what we do, and thanks for having us on the show. We at Hooked on Driving now, I've been in the Northeast 14 years, but we're hitting the 20-year mark. So this will be our 20th anniversary coming up. Bean Counter just came around, and so we've had over 20 million miles on track so far in our existence and with not one serious injury or anyone ever having to go to a hospital like that. So our safety program works, our motto of getting people out there, safety is paramount. Let's make sure they show them a good time. If they're having fun in a safe environment, they are going to learn something. You know, the way we run our group leader models, it's not 150 people out there. It's you and your 25 people and your group leader who's always going to be there to walk you through and help you and work with you, whether you have a coach or you're a solo or an advanced driver or any of our advanced driver development guys that are out there with us. I'm looking to now spend a little bit more time. So I'm going to be in the Southern region for a little bit visiting Steve. He wasn't on here, but one of the events I'm really looking forward to doing is see put together something really cool. Road Atlanta, a karting day at AMP and then an AMP track day all like within three days. So I'm going to be heading down for that. And that is going to be a lot, a lot of fun. You know, every year we do in December and in January for a week where we do our frequent driver program where people can buy a certificate and they get a good discount off. It doesn't expire. So it's not like, okay, I didn't use it this year. You can buy it now and use it over the next two or three years, however you like. I enjoy doing this with all of you. Uh, I don't look at any of the people out there as competitors. We're all in this together. I think we've scratched the surface on the availability of people that can do this. You know, this is the golden age of high performance cars nowadays. So I don't think we've hit 10% of the people that can do this out there. There's a lot of room for all of us, whatever we can all do to help each other elevate the sport and get it out to people. I love everyone that does this, man, because this is a labor of love. No one's doing this because they want to be Jeff Bezos in a year or two. We do this because we love it. It shows by everyone's passion on this. If any of you listening are at an SRO event or at an IMSA Lamborghini Super Trofeo event, find the Flying Lizard tent, come by, say hi. The Lamborghini that we're racing right now is bright pink. It was designed by my co-driver's daughter, so you can't miss it. It's got unicorns all over it. The name Sparkle Farts. We hand out a bunch of cool stuff to the kids, so if you're at an event, definitely come by. When I'm not racing, though, I do do a lot of personalized private coaching. So if you're one of those people that have maybe made the transition into club racing or some racing of some level. You've got a Motec, you've got an Aim Dash, you got a V-Box or something in your car now, and you're trying to figure out not where to find the seconds anymore, but where to find the tents. I'm your guy. So yeah, you, know, you can find me on Instagram, you can find me on my website, Annually Racing. Love to help come and help you out. Well, I have the distinct pleasure of turning the microphone over to Andy yet again to take us home and close us out and tell our audience how they can learn more about our panelists today. If you're looking to take your existing vehicle to the track for the first time and learn how to drive it at its limit in a safe and fun way, look no further than the organizations like Hooked on Driving with Mike and Mona Arrigo. Just track it with Nabila Abushar and Auto Interest with Jason Kennedy and his team. You can also take your HPD experience to the next level with Chris Cabato and the NASA program. Look for a follow-along article with this episode for more details on how you can get involved with these programs. That said, I can't thank you all enough for coming back on Break Fix. All of you have been on here before. So if you're listening to this episode for the first time hearing these voices, go back into our catalog and check out all the individual episodes with all of our panelists that we're on tonight. And I want to say we don't usually come to a consensus on a What Should I Buy episode, but I think we did kind of almost surreptitiously. There's some things that we can pull from this. Even if this is just a bucket list thing for you, get up off the couch and drive that car the way the engineers intended it to be driven. Learn how to drive that car in a fun way. Have a goal for what you want to do with this car that you bought. Is it a sports car that you want to enjoy or is it going to become a collector car in the future? It's a decision you have to make and we talk about that a lot on this show. Run what you brung, but remember that at the end of the day, the track is a diverse place and it's a welcoming place. So if you're into cars and you want to share your passion with cars with others, come to the track even just to check it out because you're going to get hooked one way or the other. So I can't thank you guys again enough for coming on the show and sharing with us. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks for having us. Us and thanks for uh, putting this all together and getting all these great people together because it's a lot of fun going back and forth. I appreciate it. It's been a blast talking with all of you guys and getting to know all of you. Appreciate you having us. All right. Thank thanks. You. Thank, Thank you, you Mark. We hope you enjoyed another awesome episode of Break Fix Podcast brought to you by Grand Tory Motorsports. 
If you'd like to be a guest on the show or get involved, be sure to follow us on all social media platforms at Grand Touring Motorsports. And if you'd like to learn more about the content of this episode, be sure to check out the follow-on article at gtmotorsports.org. We remain a commercial-free and no annual fees organization through our sponsors, but also through the generous support of our fans, families, and friends through Patreon. For as little as $2.50 a month, you can get access to more behind-the-scenes action, additional pit stop minisodes, and other VIP goodies, as well as keeping our team of creators fed on their strict diet of Fig Newtons, Gumby Bears, and Monster. So consider signing up for Patreon today at www.patreon.com forward slash GT Motorsports. And remember, without you, none of this would be possible.